Chris Mormon, welcome to Between Two Beers. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Good to see you again, mate. Uh, how's it going? Yeah, it's been a long time. Been a long time. Looking forward to catching up on some old memories. Uh, you are beaming in from Vegas. You just finished at the World Series of Poker. How would you get on? Um, I came second in one, but there's like maybe I played about 40 events uh, over the space of two months, um, just nonstop every day. Um, so it's kind of a weird thing. Like I got, I got second, I won money, but you still have a bit of uh, mixed emotions because you, you lost so many times as well. But overall, I won money, so you can't complain really with that. Yeah, we were following your progress when we were trying to get you on the show, and I saw, was it was at the last event, you were kind of going into the final day, 15 left and possibly $500,000 up top. I was trying to explain to Shay, yeah. like what that, you know, he, he might not be able to make it because he might be out celebrating half a million dollars. It didn't end up happening that way. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> the areas we're getting into. Yeah, I, I think it's important at probably at the top of the show for me to let you know, Chris, but also maybe some of the listeners, I am not a poker aficionado by any stretch of the imagination. Now, Stephen, I know, has a history. I think Stephen's going to put some context around um, Mormon, your sort of skin in the game. Is that right, Steve? <laughs> yeah, I will get there. Um, I just wanted to touch on one thing, one interesting little snippet before we get into it. There was this incredible story that came out about one of the poker rooms in Vegas, I think during the World Series, um, where it looked like there was an mm. active shooter in the poker room. And... It, it turned out it was just someone that was throwing rocks at a window, but it created this incredible stampede where like a thousand people were rushing towards the exits. And were you were you in that room at the time, Chris? Um, yeah, I was in that room, but like it started in a different casino. It started at the MGM casino, which is like um, a few casinos down the strip. And I guess people were running from casino and mass hysteria kind of, um, yeah, it broke out. It was a bit weird. I was actually in a, in a, big hand at the time I had pocket aces which is the best hand in poker you know you get it <laughs> once every 200 hands so I finally got it and then suddenly everyone started running and I had to run away from my table so I was a bit I was a bit guided you know but uh yeah it was I didn't really know what was going on I just decided to run as fast as possible and get get out of there but it turned out uh there was no shooter there was like I didn't hear anything I just saw people running and if you didn't run you're gonna get trampled on so yeah I just uh ran out and it was um afterwards we got back when we got back to the table and stuff one of the guys was i was trying to catch up with you uh but uh, yeah you were just like out there like usain bolt so i guess i, st I still got a little bit of speed in my legs <laughs> yeah um that's wild that, that's scratching the surface of some of the the wilder stories we're going to get into today but like shay is right i'm going to give you a bit of context because there will be a lot of people listening to this who don't know who Chris Mormon is and probably have a very surface level understanding of poker. So I'm going to read out a few stats which might grab your attention. So I've converted these dollars into New Zealand dollars just to make it sound a little bit more impressive. <laughs> to. So total lifetime winnings from poker, 42 million New Zealand dollars. Uh, online, so 32 million of those have come from online and 10 million have come from live casino poker. On three separate occasions, Chris has won over 1 million New Zealand dollars in a live tournament. His biggest online win was 643,000 New Zealand dollars and three other wins he's had for over $300,000. So if you've ever played a poker tournament, you might have cashed, which means you make the money where you get a return on your investment. If you do that, you're probably feeling pretty good about yourself and, and you think you're a bit of a, a gut poker player. Chris has done that 13,736 <laughs> times um, <laughs> across his career online. When you hear me say all that, Chris, does it sound a bit much? Do you sound like you maybe take it a little bit too much out of the game? Uh, sounds like I've been playing for a long time. I should probably do something else in my life, but no, <laughs> uh, I guess, yeah, I guess it's quite impressive. I've, like, uh, put a lot of time into it and, uh, just started as a hobby and kind of grew from there and, uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun with it. And the way I look at it is like, if you're having fun, you're normally winning at something. So that's the trend, how I approach it. I, I don't know if you needed to put New Zealand dollars on that, Steve, and I think 42 million <laughs> of anything is a lot, no matter what currency it's sitting in. That's very, very impressive. Yeah, I was trying to um, I was trying to beef it up, and the other thing, I was a bit disappointed um, because I was going to sell you as the most winningest online tournament player ever. But I see there's actually a few few guys that have just gotten past you in the rankings. Is that something that you like eat away at you, or you're you're actually um, um, worried about? Yeah, I've been slacking a little bit, but no, I mean, 
once you get married and stuff, it's a lot harder to justify. You know, back in the day, I was playing seven days a week, hardly slept. Uh, I was playing in my bed, and, like, even when I shouldn't be. But uh, um, now I have to go, I don't know, go out for dinners and do stuff like that. And do normal, <laughs> normal practice and stuff. So, you know, i got to keep the wife happy. So I can't play all the tournaments. I miss out sometimes. Um, yeah, I can't play on um, Poker Stars because I'm living in Vegas, so I can't play on there. So, yeah, I miss out on a few things, but... Uh, like happiness in other aspects of life. Yeah, a more fuller life. And we're going to get some of that soon. So I want to start painting the picture uh, from 2010, which is when we were living together in Papamala in Queenstown. So we were both 25 and professional online poker players, but our experience as professional poker players was quite different. So for me, it meant being slightly better than the players I was playing against and making enough to comfortably support my lifestyle. But for you, it meant being the best online tournament player in the world and literally making millions of dollars. So we had a poker house in Papamoa and moved to Queenstown with some other very good players. And we had one of them, Sean Goldsbury, on an earlier episode. But you were on a different level. I mean, can we start by explaining in your words why and how you were so much better than everyone else? um i think mainly just because poker was my life like um that's all i did like if i wasn't on the final table i'll be watching other people and i'd be trying to work out what they had I, I talked to a lot of different people and got different viewpoints and tried to put everyone's game together and develop my own kind of like super game and um yeah but for like 10 years from like the age of like 21 to 31 or so i was just playing poker non-stop didn't really do anything else uh didn't have time for a girlfriend uh like yeah i was just living living the game and just trying to become as good as i could be and uh that meant just playing a lot and uh putting a lot of effort in and uh yeah i enjoyed it but now i don't do that so much but i still try and keep up with it but um yeah the game's changed a lot but yeah was, I, I don't think it's like poker's not something like i don't know like a game like um football where you're sort of born with being the best like you know someone like Messi or someone like that like obviously they're always just gonna be a really good footballer they're born with ability but I think poker a lot of it comes from um putting a lot of hard work in and um, studying the right things and uh yeah obviously I'm, I'm I had a natural talent in numbers and stuff like that and I have a really good memory so I would always remember hands I played against people from sort of five years ago and try and work that to my advantage but um, a lot of it was just hard work, really, and uh, a lot a lot of time. It's an interesting similarity. So I work in cricket at the moment, and a lot of the cricketers that I speak to, they remember, like, deliveries and wickets, like very specific detail of games, which when you replay it back, there's literally hundreds of, of those instances. It's amazing that recall that you're talking about to be able to kind of remember those things in different games. I find that fascinating. Yeah, like I, I have the, it's funny, I remember weird things like that, but then I can't remember to take out the rubbish or something like that, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the things we do in this podcast, Chris, is we like to get stories or, or little nuggets from people that know you well. And I didn't have to try too hard because, like I said, we used to live in a house together with a bunch of lads yeah. that played poker. So I've gone to uh, Neil Stewart. Puggy82, who was actually the guy who sort of helped support me in the game. Um, and he has sent this voice note. I was a Mormon fanboy uh, to begin with. Um, I sent him a series of messages and uh, didn't get much back. But then eventually we met up in Vegas and then subsequently in Australia um, and struck up a, a bit of a friendship. But it wasn't until we went to New Zealand and uh, he moved in with us in the mountain for a few months we really became good friends. Um, what makes Chris Merman one of the best poker players in the world? Well, natural talent is, is definitely one thing. Um, work ethic, which I'll come back to shortly, but an insane memory as well for hands he'd played in the past. Um, I, I think I'm pretty good at that, but Chris just took it to another level. He would know any time he came up against anyone exactly how they played against him at any given point in the past two or three years. Just absolutely incredible. And going back to his work ethic, he would work 12, 14 hour days, six, seven days, maybe more on the trot. That was just quite incredible to witness. It was really an addiction. And 
you know, we often speak about addiction not being too healthy. Well, from a financial perspective, it certainly was healthy for Chris because, well, he was one of the best and he was he was making a lot of money. But I often doubted at the time whether it was healthy from a social perspective because he did miss out on a lot of other things. Um, it's maybe harsh to say, but I did wonder whether he should have been out more um, enjoying life and, and spending the money that he'd, he'd accumulated uh, so quickly. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, he's talking about a time in your life like when you were 25 and we were all together. Is that, when you hear him say that, do you think that's accurate? Um, yeah, 100%. Like, I, you know, like... I was doing well at poker, like about the, you know, I had, you know, I had a million dollar bankroll, whatever, and uh, I lived like a peasant, really. I was like, I, you know, I didn't, uh, I just was eating sort of takeaway pizza every day, like not going to the gym, um, only really feeling happy when I was playing poker. That's probably why I surrounded myself with it so much because I enjoyed the competition, and I enjoyed beating people and winning so much. But then once poker was done for the day, there was, you know, every day there's kind of a a bit of a low on the schedule for a few hours you know, most people sleep but i would be like oh when's the next tournament so yeah if it wasn't if it wasn't my job per se like it definitely was probably an addiction i, I just like if i had a losing day i kind of had to keep playing until i'd won or broke even um stuff like that so definitely in my 20s i just um played way too much poker but i kind of justified it to myself that you know i was winning and doing well um but i knew down the line at some point that um i try and take a step back and it would be probably more healthy for me and i'll be happier in life as well the the work ethic he talked about and and i witnessed that too i mean we all thought we we were trying hard and working hard but you were like that next level is does that come from somewhere is that family inbuilt do you think if you were doing something other than poker you would have that same work ethic um no <laughs> I, like I was always lazy at school I was always did the bare minimum to get by like um to sort of I, I went to like my problem was I went to like a really um high level school and like before that when I was um like seven to eleven years old I went to I lived in a little village and me and this one girl were basically the best in the school by a mile and I enjoyed being the best but the problem was when I went to my new school it was like all the cleverest people around you had to pass a test to get in and I tried hard for the first six months and I was maybe like top 10 out of 30 people in the class. I was above average, but I could never be number one, even if I tried my hardest. And then I, I just thought like it was all or nothing. So after that, I just did enough to get by. So I guess with poker, I saw that I could potentially be the best and it, it kind of strived me to, to just put in as much effort and work as I could. Um, like I'm the same in anything, like if I, I don't know, if I, even just playing like FIFA, you know, like a game I'm good at, I'll just play hours and hours to try and get better. But if I'm really bad at something like um, Call of Duty, I'll just snap you up. I, I'm, I'm sitting here listening, looking at you, and I have I know the stats, and I'm trying to reconcile 25-year-old me with a million-dollar bankroll. I, I worked I worked in football, so I went to, um, around a similar age, I went to a tournament, a World Cup, and I even got paid 200 US a day, and I was like, come back, eight grand, I'm loving life, thinking, yes. I'm the man here, but I spent it pretty quickly, and just the thought of having so much money at such a young age, but then being so driven and dedicated to continue to, to build that is such a fascinating mindset, it really intrigues me. Yeah, I wasn't like when I first started playing, I would play cash games, which is where you it's kind of all about the money and you just you cash in, you um, you buy in for a certain amount of dollars, let's say like a thousand dollars and you cash out, maybe you cash out for two thousand. So you've made a thousand profit and that's kind of what you do. And I started with that and I was building my bankroll and I was, you know, I was a young kid and I, you know, buy a nice TV and stuff like that. But um, I didn't I didn't I can't drive. I still can't drive to this day. So I had, I, you know, I didn't really have much. Uh, use for the money so it got to a point where I discovered these um, tournaments which is kind of what I became like my speciality and tournaments really for me it wasn't about the money it was more about uh, the rankings so like I, I joined this website which had all the poker rankings and I started off in the thousands and then I like wanted to make it to the top 100 and I remember like making it to the top 100 and then I was like well maybe one day I can make the top 10 and I went all the way to number one but, but like um, a lot of it was putting in volume. You had to, it took your top 100 results. You had to play a lot as well. So 
um, I was motivated by that. And then the sort of the money was a side thing. Like, uh, I, I didn't really know what to do with the money. My dad would always be like, oh, you should buy a house somewhere. But I didn't know where I wanted to live. And um, it's kind of how I got involved into staking people. And uh, I was like, okay, I know about poker. So I was like, well, how about if I just have all these people play for me and um, I'll cover their losses. But when they win, I get a percentage of their profit, which is what uh, you get the, a lot of like back in stables in poker because um, notoriously poker players have bad bankroll management. A lot of them are degenerates and will throw their money away on uh, casino games, stuff like that. So yeah, I started back into people and it went well to begin with, but then uh, it kind of spiraled out of control. I was, I was, I was sponsoring 30 different people at one point all by myself. And uh, when they lost, I lost and you know, it's very, very people are losing and I'm winning. I can't really cover all their losses. So those, those were some crazy times, but I didn't really know where to put my money. So I was like, okay, I'll just put it in poker, which is what I know. And uh, uh, yeah, it worked for a while, but uh, in the end <laughs> it went a bit south. You've you've kind of opened the door there. I can see if anyone's, yeah. <laughs> if anyone's watching the stream, they might have seen Stephen's eyes light up as soon as you talked about staking. And he's had to painstakingly try and explain this to me pre-recorded of pre-recording of, of this episode. So Steve, is this our opportunity to delve into the world of stables and horses? <laughs> yeah. Look, uh, you sort of sometimes lose track when you're in the poker bubble of how foreign and weird the language is. And I was <laughs> yeah. trying to explain horses and stables and bankroll management and all that sort of stuff. And she's like, what the fuck? I'm like, I, told them, I thought he played like poker. I didn't know he was a jockey. What's going on here? Just talk normally. <laughs> Just say normal words. So I've actually, so I want to explain to people because this is a really interesting part of your story. Um, so I'm going to explain in, in the simplest way kind of what you just said. Um, so basically a horse is a good poker player who doesn't have enough of their own money to comfortably play at the stakes he or she wants to. So let's say you've got a poker bank roll of $20,000, but you want to play in some really good tournaments that have, say, a $5,000 buy-in. Playing a tournament for 25% of uh, your bankroll would be a very good way to go broke. It would be a very bad idea. But if someone with a lot of money, like, Chris Mormon thinks you are a good investment and are better than the majority of the other players in a tournament, he might take you on as a horse, which means paying your buy-in in exchange for a percentage of your prize. So should you win some money in the tournament, he will take a slice of it. And yeah, you might have undersold it a little bit because this is incredible. <laughs> 30 players, like you're almost single-handedly funding the poker community. So having 30 players that you were paying to play in these tournaments meant the swings you would have on any given day were just insane. Like we're talking about the money that you've earned from playing poker and a million dollar bankroll. But I remember when we were in uh, Queenstown, you won a tournament on party poker for $50,000. And I remember being so excited for you. Like that was incredible to me. And you weren't even really that happy about it because in the background, I think like a ton of your horses hadn't done well and, and you maybe failed to even make money on that. Like looking back at that period, is that, does that sound crazy now to you? Um, yeah, because I don't even really gamble these days. Like, I'm not really a gambler. I don't play casino games. They're, I think the only thing I bet on is fantasy football, basically. Um, but back then, I was, I didn't think I was gambling. I thought I had, a, like, an edge. And it, I thought of it as an investment. So I didn't really know much about the stock market or stuff like that. So I, I was like, okay, I know poker. And back then, poker was way easier as well. So... It was easy for me and i thought oh if i can do it like i can coach these guys um i can help them i know what their weaknesses and strengths are so i can make them better players and they can play for me and also it was a way for me to take a little bit of a try and take a little bit of a back seat in the future because i thought okay there's certain days during the week like a friday where the games there's not as much action um so i can maybe just take that day off um do normal stuff real world stuff and trying to have more of a normal life but i'd still have some skin in the game and like so i'd still feel like i could earn some money and i wouldn't feel bad about taking the day off so that was kind of my ultimate goal with it and it didn't really it's a passive, income, almost. It's a passive income right yeah yeah so i guess yeah i wasn't thinking of it really like that but yeah uh but it didn't really work out like that because i ended up having to manage these very different people i didn't even have I, for some reason i decided not to get an assistant which was one of the worst things i ever did and then I had to, I was trying to sort out people's real life problems as well. And yeah, it was just, it was a shit show basically. 
Again, underselling that. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> mate, you were didn't have an assistant. You were the best online poker player in the world, and at the same time, you were running this huge business, transferring tens of thousands of dollars a day to different accounts and doing it all yourself. And mostly, it was work through a system of trust, right? You were trusting that the people were doing the right things with this money you were sending them. Obviously, you can't keep track of how everyone's playing and whether they're playing good or bad, and even if they're trying to like steal from you. Like, but there must have been some occasions where things got a bit curly and, and got away on you. Um, yeah, like definitely people um, stole from me. I, I found out about and probably once I didn't find out about because it wasn't wouldn't have been exactly hard to do because I was just not very good at checking up on things and I uh, just didn't have enough time to sort everything. I remember one month actually, um, one of my horses had won a big live tournament for like one and a half, one and a half million euros. So I got half of that and they gave it to me online. So it didn't, it didn't even feel like real money. You know, I've, I've got, I've made 750,000 euros for doing nothing and they've just sent it to me online. It's just a number on the screen and all my other horses knew about this. So then they wanted to play a higher tournament. So I, um, just decided to let them play higher tournaments for a month. And uh, then I was on the last Sunday of this, um, it's like an online festival where you play tournaments all month. So everyone's playing, it's uh, quite intense. But anyway, it's the last Sunday, the biggest Sunday of the series and a lot of money in play. And I'm actually on a um, day two of a big tournament. It's a heads up tournament. So it's just me against someone else. So you have to play every hand and it's quite intense. And at the same time, I've got 10 other tables going on. And then I've got everyone messaging me on Facebook Messenger or whatever saying, I need 5K here, I need 5K there. So I'm trying to send money, play this game, play these other, other 10 games. And then I got an error message pop up and it said, you've hit your monthly limits uh, for transfers on PokerStars, which was a million dollars I'd sent out. And uh, I probably had less than 100K back from the people. So it had been a bad month. <laughs> um, okay, I need to go back in one detail there. So you had a horse who won $1.5 million in a tournament and you had 50%. So you were getting 50% of that. How yeah. is, is money not that meaningful to you that you're kind of like watching that as a side thing or is that all your attention? Are you celebrating every time someone gets knocked out? No, I, I, I yeah, I was, I was there for it and I loved it. It was amazing. Like that was part of the, the thrill for it for me was these big final tables when one of, like a lot of these guys are my friends as well. So when they made the final table and it was sort of life-changing money for them and obviously like nice for me as well and um yeah that was part of the reason that i was kind of addicted to doing it was the the action the, the thrill of it um the, i was a blessing and a curse my first one of my first ever horses he got second in this big tournament they had in um the bahamas every year called the uh, pca and it was in january so it's at the start of the year you're kind of coming in fresh trying to crush the year at poker and I just died back in a couple of guys and he gets second in the tournament for two million dollars so i got a million just from watching him and i was there i was just getting drunk every time someone got knocked out i made another hundred thousand dollars so i was just like having time in my life woke up the next day i had to check online to make sure it was real like because i got that drunk afterwards uh and that kind of was obviously amazing but then in the long run it was kind of bad because everyone knew i won that money and they were like hitting me up like crazy and at first you know i got quite a few good players and then um i would just take on pretty much anyone who could spell poker um oh. <laughs> and you know at first i was checking how they played i knew them i was like, okay this guy's a good player and then later on i was like okay well this guy can beat the like the low stakes i'll just put in low stakes but then the problem is once they get in debt to you if they have a loot on a losing streak you uh put them in higher tournaments and that's when they'll be playing against people who are better than them and they'll have like they'll you know there'll be a dog in the field so yeah it was like amazing at the time but me doing so well at the start was also bad because i thought it was easy money so and really it was it was far from that what was the most that a horse a horse ever went into makeup for you uh was had like my what's makeup oh, is that like credit <laughs> or is that money that they owe you that they've got to that's work like out? that's the debt so if someone was say someone was 100k in makeup that would mean say his next tournament he, he'll say he won a big tournament his next tournament for 105,000. the first hundred thousand would go to me so he'd get nothing and then we'd split the five thousand profit right. 50 50 normally so oh, he wow. gets so he'd only get two and a half thousand dollars from winning 105,000. so the problem is 
once someone gets in big makeup, they kind of lose motivation to play their best because a lot of the time, you know, he could win a tournament for 50,000. He gets absolute zero from it. So he's only really doing it on good faith. And I have, you know, um, a lot of people, once they get into a hole, they, they don't get out of the hole. And you have to you have to be kind of ruthless. And I had a, a good friend of mine. He was really good at just like, you know, writing it off, getting rid of people when they're in debt to him. He basically didn't think they would ever get out of a certain number. And I always tried to like keep faith. I felt bad, and I, that you know, some of them good friends of mine. And I thought, oh, if I if I drop them, they've got nowhere else to go. They're going to have to get a real job. They don't have any qualifications. Blah blah blah. So um, yeah, I'd always keep these guys on, and nine times out of ten, it backfired. These this you know this guy was in 100k makeup, got up to 600k makeup. So like when they got to like 600k, that's kind of where <laughs> they gave up on them. That, that's a lot of money. Like that's a lot. That's yeah. a lot of money. Yeah. Holy six! God. Someone owes you essentially six hundred thousand yeah. dollars. And I guess the mindset is when you're that deep that you've got to play the bigger events to get out of it, right? Like, yeah, that's the only way you can get out of it. But they're, they're normally the harder tournaments as well. So, and the bigger buy-ins, you know, those ones cost 10,000. So that's, you know, every time they don't cash, it's another 10,000 straight onto that number. So I had a guy before I dropped him, he was 600K in makeup. And then he wins the tournament um, like the next week on his own money or he got in for a, um, a cheaper tournament. And he won it for like 80,000. 80, so whatever it wouldn't have cleared the 600,000 anyway but I was still oh wow damn I would have would have been nice to have that and anyway to the 80,000 he played uh, this tournament which is like one of the most prestigious online tournaments called the uh, world championships online poker main event and he ended up chopping that one for 500,000 and uh, I think he sent me like 2,000 so that was <laughs> <laughs> yeah it wasn't it wasn't the best <laughs> the um the rudimentary like analogy I've got in my head as you're talking is and I'm, I'm unpacking what you're saying is it's almost like poker entourage where you're you're the Vincent Chase <laughs> and you've you've got your entourage sort of playing for you but sort of working off your success essentially right yeah like when they when I did well they were happy because they knew they could play a tournament next week <laughs> But you, there's a, there was something you said in there as well. So are you also attempting or trying to coach some of these guys to get better at the same time as funding them? Yeah. Originally, when I took on, at first I only had like five to ten guys and it was a lot more feasible. I could have, like do a group coaching session and uh, work on people's games. When they play that, when people play a tournament online, you can request to um, get all the hands that you played and they'd email it to me and then I'd like look over them you know, when I finished playing for the night, um, I'd look over them before I went to sleep and like make some notes and, you know, send it off to them. And yeah, I did that. I, I, definitely the first couple of years I was doing that with like most of my people. But then, you know, once um, I got too many people, it was just, it just wasn't enough time in, in the day to do that. So it's kind of, that's when it kind of started going badly. Really. I've heard you tell a story, Chris, about one time you won a tournament online for like $100,000 and lost money on the day as a result of your huge stable of horses not doing well. Do you remember like the biggest downswing on one day combined of you not having a good day and all of your horses having a really bad day? Um, I mean, it's kind of hard to say on one day because... Um, but I probably would have been in a live tournament. Like, I, they, you know, they had these big 10K buy-in tournaments and multiple times I've put like 20 people in and maybe like yeah. everyone gets like basically one person out of 20 made it through day one. So instantly you just lost, lost 190,000 there and now you're relying on that one guy to do good. So like you still think, you've got, still got a little bit of hope. You're like, maybe this guy will just win the tournament and like make me money. But uh, yeah, it didn't happen. I got double charged the other day buying a coffee and I was raging at five, at five dollars. I can't even imagine. Oh man, it's got to make yourself immune to it. It's just money. It comes and goes. Um, there's one more story I want to bring up about your, your horses. Um, and it was in your book, so I think it might be okay to talk about. Um, one of your horses put a prostitute on makeup one night. Um, <laughs> he couldn't pay, he, he ordered some prostitutes to his, his hotel or whatever, and he couldn't pay for them he was broke himself and he was in makeup so the only the only way that you had to front up for it to pay for him and then added it to his makeup is that right? yeah yeah i was hoping he would try harder for the next week but he just kept losing at, at which aspect of it <laughs> i was like, hoping he got it out of his system and he could it. <laughs> oh man but, okay. i did all kinds of stuff i put i put a guy's wedding ring on makeup before as well all kinds of stuff yeah 
<laughs> Looking back, like these are such entertaining stories to tell. Do you think back at that point of your life as something good that happened that you learned from or something that you, you really shouldn't have done and it was a big mistake? Um, no, I always have to say no regrets. You know, I did it. I had made a lot of friends and had a lot of fun doing all that stuff. Obviously, you know, like you behave way different in your 20s to in your, in your 30s in any walk of life, really. But poker is such a, a like a weird kind of, um, just it's just a different world, really. Like uh, I'd come from university, I'd sort of um, left the real world and like was thrown into this foreign world of not really known. I'd, I just didn't have like value for money for sure. Like, um, you know, you're playing poker every day for thousands of dollars. And um, even when you win, the, it's just a number on the computer screen. So it was funny. Like I had a lot more respect for like, um, like UK pounds than US dollars because I would always play poker in dollars. So when I was in America, I just sort of, I didn't really care about these like hundred dollar bills or whatever. Whereas in the UK, like a 20 pound note seemed like way more money to me because I associated it. I'd had like, you know, kind of shitty jobs growing up where you, you're getting 10 pound an hour or whatever. So um, that felt like real money, whereas American money felt like play money. Um, that's a nice little seg into the next voice note I'm going to send uh, about the respect for the value of money. So we had Sean Goldsbury on uh, a podcast on one of our earlier podcasts which if you're enjoying this go back and listen to sean's because it was really good too um but this is part of the episode i'll share two more stories with you which i don't know if you've heard these days but um one of my best nights in las vegas ever was going to watch him on a world series event and he was playing live poker and he got a second or third for eight hundred thousand us dollars and so 10 o'clock friday night we just go out we've been drinking watching him and we we're already quite cut we went out on a bend down i got him at 9 30 on saturday night so, <laughs> so it, was, it, was, it was a good session and more, but paid for the lot and more. And we were all playing poker and he was playing for it. And he was just, um, yeah, there's about 20 of us. It wasn't a small crew. Um, I also, not long after that, he um, he ran up the house from Las Vegas on one evening. He's like, we've been out in the beers. He's like, have you seen my backpack? I'm like, no, nah, I don't know. He's like, oh, I can't find it. Eh? I mean, oh, that's fine. And he's like, yeah, there's 60 grand on it. I want you what? <laughs> He had sixty thousand dollars in poker chips and cash because he had all these horses he was backing, and he had just been on the piss and left the backpack somewhere. And so he's running around all the boys trying to find the backpack. Like he's just on the hangover. Like, like, like that, that level you talked about with the money I was talking about. Like I was that with him. He was just a different level from me again. He was just it was crazy. I think um, the bigger, perhaps that last anecdote. It paints the clearest picture of the difference between your life and perhaps everyone listening that you could have sixty thousand dollars in a backpack and not know exactly where it is at all times yeah like that was just a combination of me being an idiot as well but um <laughs> yeah i mean like um it was funny when i first met my wife now like um we went i went to play a tournament a uh, big um, tournament in barcelona and i went to buy into the main event and maybe we'd been dating for a couple of months at this point. So I didn't know each other super well. And um, so I go to buy into the tournament at the cashier and they asked me if I wanted to buy in with cash or with my account. And um, I was like, what account? And they were like, oh, you left some money here, with, <laughs> here last time. I didn't even know. And they were like, I was like, oh, how much is in there? And they were like, um, 50,000 euros. And I, I didn't even know about it. So then stupidly, this tournament was like a 5,000 buy-in. So I was like, oh, wow. Like, I've, I just found 50,000 I didn't know about. Um, but yeah, there was this other tournament going on, which is called a high roller, which I never normally play. But I was like, well, I just found 50,000 euros. So it's kind of a free roll. So I decided to jump in this $50,000 tournament. I did actually sell some action. So I, I you know, maybe I sold like half. So I only put 25,000 in. So I still guaranteed myself a profit on this thing. And then I decided to block it all off with, um, seven five off suit which is a really bad hand to anyone who doesn't understand poker but yeah I, I i at this point as well i just got rid of i'd had to drop all of my horses because i'd been losing so much of them and now i just found fifty thousand euros so most people were like okay wow that's nice i'll sit on that but i just decided to put most of it in on one tournament and uh, yeah like steve said earlier that's not a good idea for bankroll management when you when you cut those horses off how much can you quantify the makeup or do you not even want to think about um, I don't know exactly. I, I, I didn't really want to count it up exactly, but I would have guessed about the total was probably about 
three million dollars that I had to oh, for <laughs> 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 but like it's it's one of those things like like um you like you can actually sell sometimes for a while like people would sell their horses to other people but you'd maybe like take you get like 15 20 cents on the dollar it depends on the horse like if, if someone had maybe thirty thousand in debt then that's you know you're quite likely to get that back but a lot of my guys had like 250,000 in debt so it's really hard to get that back um so like if even if they were a good player you might only be able to sell them for like twenty five thousand dollars for like 10 for the price but um it got to the stage where everyone kind of knew i was i needed the money so no one was offering me anything for them <laughs> so i just had to throw them on the free transfers did um sorry steve i know you got a, a question coming up but calling them horses is that an easier way of not personalizing the fact that you're actually dealing with <laughs> steve my friend I know yeah he of, i know he wasn't one of your horses but I don't know. I, I feel like it wouldn't be allowed it back in 2022. Like, horses <laughs> came out now, but like back then, it's just where everyone called them. So, you know, like I wouldn't, I would, I would call them their names. I know all their names. So, yeah, they, they were my friends. But, uh, did you know their names or did you know their usernames? <laughs> <laughs> I knew both. I knew, I knew their <laughs> passwords and everything. <laughs> um, you mentioned your wife, Katie, and this is going to blow people's mind. If, if what we've spoken about already hasn't grabbed your attention, like, because I put in my notes, um, I was wife's actually um, a good poker player too. And then I went and looked up her record. <laughs> so she has over a million NZDs in live caches and three million in online caches. Like, <laughs> that's that's insane as well. Like, um, was she when you met her? Uh, where was she on on her poker journey? Was she? Did you help train her? Was she good on her own? Um, she's always had like really good natural instincts, uh, which I think is really important in poker. Um, she's she played poker before I started playing poker, but um, she stopped playing for a while and she was doing other stuff um, before Black Friday happened, which is when um, poker kind of was made illegal in the US uh, online, and um, it was a whole big. Um, before that, she was she was a poker agent basically, so. For the big final tables at the World Series of Poker main event, she would um, sign people up on a patch deal and she would get a percentage of what they won. And um, yeah, she had a lot of famous people. Um, it was weird because a few times we've been in the same room uh, for various events, um, but we never spoke. And then we like spoke like a few years later. So it's funny, we laughed because like if we'd have met like a few years earlier, probably nothing would have ever happened because I was kind of just in my poker zone anyway. So. Um, but yeah, she's like, we talk hands and like discuss things, but like, actually she plays way more aggressive than me. Like she calls me a massive nip. So she's a maniac. Yeah. <laughs> like I've sort of mellowed out a little bit in my old age, but um, she's yeah. just, she just gets crazier and crazier. So, um, but yeah, she's been crushing it um, the last couple of years, particularly like um, earlier this year, she was actually ranked the, the number one female in the world for like, a few, like a short space of time. So that was pretty cool and uh, she doesn't have this it's funny she doesn't have the same love for poker as me like i'll still be like oh you got you got getting this tournament she'll be like moaning that i'm a slave driver um <laughs> but um she just has like she's really good at reading people particularly in live poker she's like gets a lot of information out of people um she's she likes the social aspect of it as well like i prefer online where you sort of can play at home just ch yeah chill by yourself where she likes to um chat it up at the table at the casino and even like if if i go and play at the casino and i lose for the day then i've had a bad day but she can lose and still have fun with it and make friends and yeah so she she really enjoys more the social aspect of it and uh it's been doing well as well was there one tournament where you met heads up it was like a twenty thousand dollar prize and you were like playing in the same house but what was the dynamic like during that one um, yeah, it was fun because as she'd gone out, so she was playing at a restaurant near our house and just having a couple of drinks with a friend and it started getting deeper into the tournament, maybe 20 left. So she was like, okay, I'm going to stop drinking now. And she came home and she was like, I'm deep in this tournament. And I was like, oh, did you not check the lobby? And she was like, what do you mean? <laughs> I, I was like, I'm still in too, but we just hadn't been on the same table at that point. And then, um, yeah, we got deeper and deeper in the tournament and then we ended up being the last two players. And at that point she sort of moved into my office and the funny thing was like if to, this is kind of a special tournament if you win it you got like a world series of poker circuit ring and i, I didn't really care about these things but it, i knew it had been her goal to win one of these things for a while like she wanted to win one of these more than a world series poker bracelet even though a bracelet's 
way more prestigious really so it was a weird feeling because my natural instincts obviously is always to like to win and you know just uh, yeah just crush my opponent basically but then i i was like also thinking oh god she really wants to win i don't really want to win and like you know we're married we share the same money so it was like there was no financial interest but you know i just still had to play my best and try and win um and i i ended up making a big bluff and um she called me and then i kept bluffing the next card and she called again and i got really lucky and basically hit like a miracle last card and um normally you'd be like boom got there like yes i'm gonna win a big pot but i was just like oh my gosh she's gonna kill me here <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah she she had a monster hand that she was sort of playing it slow and um i got really lucky on her and ended up winning the tournament and uh still she's been searching for this circuit ring since i was hoping she would win one like a month later and it wouldn't be such a big deal but she still has she's got like a few seconds and thirds since and uh still hasn't won this damn ring so like i'm sitting there with my ring on the mantelpiece so <laughs> <laughs> i i really appreciate the dumbed down detail of that hand, i know <laughs> you could have gone into such intricate detail about every street and, and all this sort of stuff but that's really good but what was the dynamic like when you're in that room together like the the chat going between the two of you it must have been um yeah it was funny actually she like she made a big bluff against me and i was deciding what to do i wasn't sure what to do and she said something like oh it was like a famous line for the um famous poker player back in the day scotty Wynn said and he was like if you call it's going to be all over baby and i folded and then she like showed me the bluff on the table and i was like no and so, I was <laughs> and, and so she she outplayed me to be fair but like in poker like especially if you're in the last two players even if you're a better player or whatever even if you don't play well and the you still going to win 40 percent of the time like when it's the last two players there's just a lot of luck involved and um yeah so i felt bad that she lost uh because she probably got the better of me that time but uh, it didn't work out for her can, can i pick one detail of that story which fascinates yeah. me would you said at the start that she was out for dinner and drinks while she was playing yeah my rudimentary understanding of like <laughs> online poker would be you sat in front of a laptop in a room playing but so you can do everyday life at the same time as playing in tournaments and then as it drills down to the business end then you start to really focus is that is um that yeah well, well when i play i normally play a lot of games at once where she will play like less games at once so she was actually only playing one table she like she really wants to win this um like the ring so she played this ring event because it was on they were on every night that week so she was like, i'm just gonna play this one tournament i'm gonna go out with my friend have drinks and dinner and like play on my ipad because they have like a an app like an app that you can download through ipad so she was just playing on her ipad casually and you know it went down from 400 players to the last 20 and she was like okay well i should probably go home and play on a natural computer and like take this seriously now so yeah so, that yeah so no so in the same way i'm at dinner with someone scrolling instagram and not yeah. really being present and the, that's the same thing that she's doing but with a live game of poker essentially yeah yeah exactly although oh, she's gone. like someone who can multitask <laughs> everything she'll probably be shopping at the same time and um yeah fascinating it's, it's such a like five different things yeah it's an absolute subculture and you've just said you play multiple games at once which blows my mind as well but uh, we can get into the details shortly yeah so I, I want to pick up onto the live scene now so we sort of went in different directions um around the end of 2010 um you moved back to vegas and about a year later, you blew up on the live scene. So 15th of June, 2011, you come third in a tournament at the World Series for $430,000. Two weeks later, you come second in a tournament for over 1 million. Then a few months later, you come second in another one for 1 1.6 million. Now, was that just an incredibly good run of luck or were you kind of due to have these big scores live? Uh, it was a bit of a combination of both. Like I've been playing live for a, like maybe five years before that. And um, wait one second, my dog's going, hey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, I'll start over. Yeah, so it's kind of a combination of both, really. Like I've been playing live poker for sort of five years before that and hadn't really done anything. Like I was always winning online. I go and play a live tournament and 
lose it back. And I would joke that I was like the biggest loser in life poker. Uh, my mum would always like, she got to the point of saying that you should maybe just stick to online. And that I had a lot of tells that I was giving away. Like people could know that I had a good hand by my face and I couldn't, yeah. Like at, at times I'd even try to wear sunglasses at the table, which is what a lot of people do to try and hide things. But I felt like an idiot wearing sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't take, I, I think I played one hand in my career with sunglasses. I actually won it. And it was a standard hand I raised and everyone just folded. So it wasn't even a big hand, but I felt really nervous. And I was like, okay, well, that's not for me. So <laughs> anyway, like, yeah, 2011 comes by and, you know, it's just like, well, I play these tournaments again, not expecting much, sort of getting a bit frustrated, like the same old questions, like people ask me in interviews, like maybe like, do you going to change your game, whatever. And then just everything was working out for me. Um, um, definitely some of it was, confidence like the first one obviously like i probably just um played okay and got lucky won some big like all-ins and stuff like that but then maybe like the second or third fourth tournament that i did well in that year like a lot of it comes from confidence you, you tend to see a lot of players they go on it's called a heater when basically you go on a winning streak and uh it feels like when you're on a winning streak it feels like you can't lose but Conversely, when you're not, when you're on the losing streak, it feels like you can't win again. So it works both ways. But um, yeah, 2011 was kind of my golden year. I just, whatever I touched turned to gold. I remember I was actually staying in a house with um, Pug in that in Vegas. And we, I didn't know where the house was until I like moved in on the day. Cause I was just, yeah, I, I wasn't obviously organizing stuff. I didn't, I was too busy doing my horses. So I just like got the address from Pug and then I get there and I realized the whole house was like, 45 minutes or something crazy away from the strip where we're going to be playing poker every day. So I was kind of a bit, bit annoyed that it was so far away, but maybe it made me try extra hard in the tournaments because I knew it was a long, long time. <laughs> so it was weird that year. I just kind of like never went home. I was just always in a tournament. I just, you know, I kept making day two, day three, day four of these tournaments. Suddenly I'm at the final table, whatever, come third and one, then the next tournament I'm back at the final table. It was insane. Um, it's not normally like that. And it's, it was definitely like a good run of luck, but I also was, I felt good about the way I was playing as well. I mean, it's hard not to when it's all working out for you, but it wasn't like I suddenly started doing something massively different per se. Does the money seem more real when you win it live? Because I've heard you talk about, you know, the hundreds of thousands of dollars you transfer or you win a tournament and it's in your account, but when you're winning a tournament live, do they put like the million dollars on the table heads up like they do at the world series like i've seen some photos of you with stacks it's of notes cash. of cash around you. Like that um, yeah they do different. they do tend to although i think a lot of them is like the the bills are like real on the first couple and then the rest is fake but but when you do actually like when you cash out you can get it all in cash like um when i got second in the world series of poker europe in france um i'd swapped out maybe like 20 percent with friends so i had to pay them and they wanted money for the next tournament so I got all the money in um, 500 euro notes and just put it in my backpack. So I was walking around with a million euros in my backpack and I was just handing out 20K here to 20K there. And I was just like walking into McDonald's with the backpack and a million euros on it. Was did, lucky. You feel like, did you feel lucky like that? Yeah, man, did you feel like the fucking man doing that? Did you feel uh, like that? I, well, kind of, but then I also <laughs> like, I put it all in this safe. The next tournament was in Italy. So we took like a taxi over to, Italy and uh, maybe like an hour taxi and get there and I just shoved it all in the safe put the code in and then um that night I sort of played the tournament and I was like okay well, before we go out to drink um actually no I think we'd like gone out and I got drunk and I went just uh, before I went to sleep I was like okay I'll just check the money still there just peace of mind tried to open the safe and uh the one code there would be wasn't working so then I started shit my pants and uh <laughs> went down to like lobby reception and no one spoke English. And then I, in the end, they said the manager would come the next day, but uh, yeah, I'm just in the hotel room with like one of my good friends who's actually one of my horses. And I was like, wow, you're the only person, I'm the only other person who knows this code. So if it's gone, I don't know what's going to happen here. But <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you're either a really good bluffer and you've like got someone to run off with the money. You're just like hanging out here. So it doesn't look sus or like maybe it's still there. <laughs> But luckily the next day the manager came up and the manager's i guess not allowed to look so they open up and they like they weren't they weren't looking they were like sir is is what you were looking for still there and i'm just like looking at a million euros going yeah few few but i wasn't even concerned about the money i was more concerned about 
uh, all my friends giving me shit. Like, you know, <laughs> I think that might be the quote which separates you. Yeah, but million euros was was secondary. Well, yeah, it secondary was the, to the it shame. was the pants from the lads, which I could. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have you ever have you ever put all the cash out on a bed? and just lay on it and sort of done a, a, a cash snowman uh i can't say i've done that one to be honest uh, no. you haven't lived you haven't lived moment next time next time um again a rudimentary and that like a, a summation or an analogy but there's a difference between playing online and playing live tournaments is that akin to like a, a white i'm using a cricket one again here like a white ball cricketer versus a test match cricketer like is it you can you specialize in one but you can also play the other one and no one really does both of them really really well or is um, really not yeah, a little bit like mm -hmm. but there are like a lot of people now have crossed over like at the time it was like you're either one or the other like maybe 10 years ago but now most of the good online players are good live as well because uh on live you play um bigger bigger tournaments for example they have the world series poker main event which pretty much everyone who's a calls himself uh, like a real poker player will play and that's um it just finished just now but it's ten thousand dollars to buy in and it gets like nine thousand people so first place in that was 10 million this year so i mean if you're good at online poker you you know you want to play that anyway you, you don't just stick to one because that's just like life-changing money and so like a lot of there's like i was i would say like back in the day i was just mainly an online player and then i sort of graduated to live and then there's quite a few other examples of people who are like that as well there's only a couple there's actually one guy this Swedish guy who just plays online in, in Sweden uh Lena he's called and he just he's kind of an enigma he just plays online he's played like I've, I've met him at a few casinos playing live events but online he's just an animal he's like the best player now it's by a long way it's like overtaking my all-time earnings and he just plays like I did when I was in my 20s like seven days a week and he never really goes and plays live so it's kind of weird but like he he just crushes online uh, but not many people like that most of the people who are good online are good live and, and vice versa did you feel and and not to be disrespectful but when we were living together like puggy kind of said there wasn't that that social side was a lot more awkward than the man you are today you seem very well put together but we were all struggling with different parts of our life but was that transition to live did you feel that in those early days was quite intimidating like that that life setting actually interacting with people as opposed to just being yourself in a laptop um actually no like i i felt comfortable at the the live tables uh, i knew what i was doing i felt like i was better than these other players um every everything else in like actual like going out and meeting new people and being in big groups yeah that's kind of intimidating for me and um just being outside my natural habitat but like at the end of the day it was still poker and i'm like by that point most people sort of knew who i what was as, as well and uh so i didn't really i didn't feel it like when i was playing poker but i definitely felt it like say if i was going on a night out i might drink too much alcohol to try and cover that up or stuff like that so and like for like longest time i would sort of um eat unhealthy sort of gain weight and you know didn't feel good about myself so then that's like harder to obviously like meet new people and stuff like that so i didn't feel like when i was playing live poker though so i wasn't really couldn't really use that as an excuse why it sucks and uh <laughs> um there's a part i know shay's really keen to get into it's about your mental skills coach that you got and i think it was you linked up with him just before your first big win which was in 2014 at the wpt um can you talk about what what that how that improved your play um yeah i was going through like probably my hardest time i ever had in poker i just got rid of all the horses and i was basically building my bankroll up um over again and i thought it'd be fun because of, you know like you win a tournament and the money matters and like you you go down the stakes and um but i definitely probably had like more of an ego than i actually thought i did and like i was playing these lower tournaments and you know like in these low lower tournaments you get a lot more people in the tournament because it's more affordable so like maybe i'd be playing a 30 dollar tournament and there'd be five thousand people in this thing and i'd come 15th place uh like you know i'd be playing for 10 hours and come 15th so it was very frustrating and at the time i just started dating katie as well so i felt like you know i was trying to make money to 
provide for us. I felt an added pressure, whereas previously it was just kind of like I, I wasn't really concerned about the money because I, was, you know, I had a bankroll and I wasn't buying stuff. But now I wanted to like go and do nice things, and uh, you know, money was not as good as it was before. So I definitely was getting like frustrated. I took like nine months or so. I didn't play any live tournaments because they were like um, bigger, bigger buying. So I was like, okay, I'll just focus, play online, build up my bankroll, kind of kind of like a, a plan and you know the plan wasn't sort of coming to fruition like I've been playing for a few months and was break even and getting more and more frustrated and annoyed and generally like being a, like it got to the point where Kate was like getting frustrated like she said that I was turning into a different person you know like from the person she met a few months ago and would I meet this guy her friend had started working with him and um I kind of didn't want to, but I, I did it basically just to appease her. And uh, I was playing online for a series in Vancouver at the time. And he he flew out from the UK, he's a British guy as well. So that helped me like wanting to meet him being British as well. Uh, he flew out um, to meet me. He had like a friend he was seeing as well, but he flew out. Uh, I didn't offer him anything. He's just agreed to meet me. He'd obviously probably Google me and seen that I knew what I was doing with poker. So it might be a good thing, <laughs> good thing for him in the long run. But yeah, he still had faith. And I met up with him and straight away, I just felt super comfortable talking to him about just anything really like stuff I hadn't talked to, uh, talked to my friends about, you know, like stuff like, for example, like being bullied at school, uh, growing up and stuff like stuff like that. Just like, and, uh, like, obviously I hadn't really dealt with, um, emotionally, I hadn't really dealt with losing, like having to start all over again in poker. Cause I kind of felt a bit stupid. I'd won all this money and I didn't have much to show for it. And, uh, yeah, I started working with him and instantly I, I noticed like a shift in my mood. I was definitely more of a sort of a positive person than I'd been for the last six months before that. And uh, I went and played. Yeah, I did. It started having on a little mini heater online. So I was like, OK, whatever, I'll go and play this tournament uh, in L.A. And I was living there at the time, so it was near my house. So I didn't really have any expenses to go and do it. Went and sold like 50 percent to my friends. Just so it was a 5K buy instead of a 10K. So I didn't feel like added pressure of losing a lot if it went badly and yeah I just every day I, it was like a seven day tournament I kept making the next day and then suddenly we're down to the farm table and I end up winning it for like over a million dollars and it was like just a sort of an amazing moment because I'd been trying to win a, a proper life tournament for so long and it was also the perfect timing because it like meant so much to me like if it had, if it had happened like three or four years earlier I wouldn't it wouldn't have been such a big deal because like uh, I didn't need the money as much but also I'd also hadn't tried as hard. Like I've been playing like at this point, I've been playing live poker for the best part of a decade and could never, never win one of these things. So to finally win it, like made it like 10 times more enjoyable. Amazing for you to share that. And I think while we earlier probably made light of some of the losses, I can imagine like how that weighs on your conscience <clears throat> when it's your chosen vocation, right? And your sense of identity and things come from, from some of those wins and some of those losses. So it's amazing that you, sought that help but and, but secondly like how those tools that you were given that were able to make such an impact on your life as well yeah like as you start obviously you start doubting yourself as well like i had a lot of friends who played who were like who at the time i thought were better than me or at various stages and they'd um given up poker altogether and done something else and i didn't really have anything to fall back on i didn't have um qualifications so i was like well i have to make this work but at the same time, the game was changing. Uh, people were getting a lot better. I had to completely change my game, which was hard to do because you, you know, you have a game that you think works and has been so, so successful you, for you. So it's hard to completely switch it up. But I knew I had to do that and make some changes. And also, the the mental side of it was a big thing. And British people don't really like to sort of talk to people about their problems. They try and sort them out. But uh, yeah, I was I was struggling to do that. So speaking to this guy really sort of helped give me the kickstart and turn it around. And even now, like eight, eight years later, however, I still talk to him sort of every so often, especially during the world series. So like this last couple of months, I basically did a weekly call with him every Wednesday, sort of at 10 AM, depending on what was going on to speak to him for 30 minutes about life stuff and poker. How's it going? How's my sort of mental feelings at the table? Am I having fun? Just like remind myself the stuff that I know works for me and, uh, yeah, like I still, even though I don't need him really, but every time it was weird. Like so often when I talk to him, like I 
um, the next week I have like a big win or something like that. So, I mean, I have to talk to him, you know. <laughs> is, is that is that how the game has evolved, the sport has evolved, is that now it's people are bringing in these other elements to it to help enhance the natural ability or mitigate some of the luck elements of, of, of poker? Oh, yeah, definitely. I know a lot of people who like meditate and uh, speak to mind coaches. And I mean, it's kind of, I guess, similar, a bit similar to golf. Like you need to have, um, there's going to be ups and downs. Like, like even if you're a really good player, you know, like you're going to take a few bad, bad bounces, a few bad beats in poker. And you just kind of have to suck it up and forget about it and move on. And it's easier said than done. And like when it's going badly, it can feel like it's never going to turn around. But the, especially in tournaments, it's weird. Like most of the tournaments I'll play, like during the World Series, will be like a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, so around that. Most of them are like between five thousand and a thousand. And you know, you play a lot of them; it adds up quickly. You know, you, you can lose fifty to hundred thousand dollars if it's going badly. And then, like recently, so I started off like the World Series this this summer. First couple of weeks, you know, didn't do much. Maybe I'm down twenty five thousand. You like start feeling bad about yourself. And then I get second in this. It was only a five hundred dollar buy-in as well. Five hundred dollars to play. I get second in out of four thousand eight hundred and eighty-six people, or whatever. And I get second for one hundred fifty thousand. And instantly, I, one tournament turns it around. So you just have to be ready. So when that tournament comes around and your luck's on your side, that you're ready to take the opportunity. Because if you're not, then you you know you've blown it. And then who knows when the next time's coming around so it's it's hard though in the moment when you lose you're expected to lose like every, you know you're gonna gonna lose eight times out of ten you turn up so even when you're the best in the world so it's, it's hard to like um accept that really in, in some of those those down periods or some of those those um not not heaters i don't know what the fuck i'm trying to say here <laughs> some of those coolers. yeah on some of those cooling periods <laughs> did, you, did you ever genuinely think about throwing it away and doing something else um yes and no you're like oh maybe you do you you think it's funny you're like be like oh i'm the worst and like you know to the outside person they'll be like oh, well, what about all these achievements you made and you're like well that's the past like you only feel like you're only as good as your last tournament and if like, you didn't play real well or you misplayed a hand like, you can it's easy to get down there yourself and yeah at the time you're like oh i must am i still enjoying this as much and am i am i not enjoying it because i'm losing or is it because i've been doing it too long so you definitely can there's so much time to overthink things and like get in your head but you kind of just have to especially in the world series because like uh, it starts maybe end of may and then it finishes like end of july so you're playing every day at the casino 12 hour days and you, most of the time you know you get knocked out and then you just start new tour and the next day you're buying again with cash and you know you lose again and then you just keep doing it and you feel like you kind of feel like a degenerate sometimes when it's going bad you feel like do i still have an edge and then then yeah then you realize you do and you're like okay I, I know what to do but it's definitely sometimes you um can get in your head about it just to close the loop on the online poker stuff um i want to go back to black friday and you kind of mentioned it um april 15th 2011. so the united states department of justice issues an indictment against poker stars full tilt and absolute poker essentially shutting them all down freezing everyone's money now at this point you are probably the best online tournament poker player in the world and you've got this huge stable of horses so overnight do you remember where you were when you heard this was all happening and was that a big freak out moment and is that when you decided to just you had to cut all the horses and eat that sort of three million dollar loss um i remember exactly where i was yeah i was um, playing a live tournament in england and uh people like rumor started going around the car room and then straight away people went outside to the, like, the car park and were like trying to cash out money on their laptops. And then I had my horses like hit me up, uh, but like obviously a lot of them were in America. So it was, um, it was late at night there. So they were, I tried to get them to transfer me the money. And I think I like as that week, I spent like a week, like not getting out of bed much. It was, a, <laughs> it was a tough week for sure. Um, but no, I actually, well, I got rid of, I basically put people on hold for a few months it was just before the world series the world series is in the summer so i was like okay well if you still want to play the world series i'll put you in the world series of poker on the on the current makeup and then we'll see what we want to do after that so after that a few people moved outside of america and carried on playing and then a bunch of them just um gave up altogether. so obviously i ate the makeup on on those guys but i still had a lot of horses at that point it wasn't until a couple of years later when 
things have been going worse. Uh, I kind of been trying to chase the losses from other people and it hadn't worked out. So that's when I got rid of them like two years later. But yeah, the, the Black Friday was like a crazy week where I was just like, uh, didn't really know what to do because it was unprecedented. And everyone was asking me, well, how's this work now? And I was like, I have no idea. To go. So I was trying to find out from other backers and we were all trying to work it out and see what was fair and um, just try and make the best of a bad, really bad situation. And as a result of that, it meant you couldn't play in America anymore, but you could still play from other countries. So I think you might have lived in you know, New Zealand, that was before that, but Cyprus, Canada, Central, South America. Like yeah, I mean, at, at the time I was actually in living in England, so it didn't affect me like that um, directly. I could still play myself. It was more just uh, maybe like 20 of the 30 horses I had were American, so that they couldn't play anymore. So they, now I've got this money just sitting there in limbo, like um, no way of getting it back. So um, it was more just like, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do with them in the future and trying to work out sort of um, plans, whether they were going to carry on playing poker or if they were going to get a, a real job and stuff like that. So it was more the stress of dealing with that. Um, but I could still play myself. So I kind of, that's when I focused more on myself. And I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but obviously that was right before 2011. And that's when I started doing good live. So it might be the case that I focused more on myself. And uh, my game before that has maybe struggled a bit just because I just didn't have time to work on it. And then I like um, regrouped and like knuckled down and like uh, made some adjustments. And Or it might have just been good luck. So who knows? But yeah. You're, you're quite unique. Chris, as, as someone who plays with such large amounts of money and is in casinos a lot, that you don't actually gamble yourself, right? You don't do sports betting. You don't do the, the sort of games, the blackjack and the roulette and things. But you must have witnessed some incredibly degenerate things from either people you were friends with or in the casinos over the years. Are there any just like absolutely mind-blowing stories that you've witnessed or you've heard about from the sort of wider poker community? Yeah, one of one of my best friends. I went like I don't know if you do you have Lad Lad Bible. Have you heard of that? In, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it went viral on Lad Bible. This he won a tournament um, for like I think he won it for like fifty five thousand pounds. So like decent, but not like one of the huge huge ones, but decent enough. And we know the owner of this casino where he won it, at, and he got the, the owner to um, make basically. He said if he puts it on uh, red or black on roulette. That they wouldn't they'd take the zeros off as well so he basically got a straight 50 50 bet and he he bet it that night when they're drinking he put 50 the whole winnings all on red and i think actually all on black and it came through and like obviously it was people were videoing it as well on like their mobile phones and the, the video went viral it's got like hundreds of thousands of like views on youtube and stuff so that was pretty degenerate and actually that same guy was funny like one of the first times we met we were like watching the world cup in vegas um, like a sports book and um, we're getting like expensive shots of tequila, like 1940, Don Julio, 1942. And this bill comes through and it's pretty expensive. And uh, I, don't, you, I don't know if your listeners know this, but one thing we do to decide bills in like with poker players, rather than sort of everyone throwing like 50 bucks or whatever, <laughs> we, we basically everyone throws in their credit card. Oh, and yes. <laughs> one at a time we go around and whoever picks out last has to pay the whole bill. So anyway, maybe there's like 20 of us in this booth watching the game. And obviously everyone's ordered drinks, everyone's ordered food, and we've got like these expensive shots. So the bill comes out and it's pretty chunky. And um, anyway, everyone throws a card in and we're down to like the last five guys and me and this other guy is still in. He's been on like an insane heater. He's like 22 years old, just become friends with this guy, but he's already won like three big live tournaments. So whatever he does touch, turns to gold. So he's like the, the new golden boy and I'm like a bit older than him at this point. And anyway, like five people left and they pull out his card and what we do as well, like some people can't really afford to pay this bill. So what we did is just um, they can buy out for like a 20th of whatever the bill is. And whoever comes second in this thing gets the second place money. So they actually make money. So the <laughs> right. difference between first and second is even bigger than the actual bill. So like anyway, maybe like the bill was like $1,500 and like second place we get like 500 bucks, something like that. So it was like a 2K swing. And anyway, they pull out his car with five left and he, he gets pulled out. So he's not in anymore. And like everyone would be happy not to be in really because it's not really worth flipping for 500 and 1500. So obviously uh, bad odds. But he was like, no, I want to come second and puts his car back in. So anyway, <laughs> which was, it was obviously just like, yeah, it's not a good move. But he was just like he was running that good that he didn't care. 
anyway, now they pull my card out and I knew that that was a bad thing to do, but I was like, I'm not having this young kid kind of come in here and like, like do this. So I was like, okay, I'll do the same. So anyway, the other three guys in there are all like, so you guys are just going to keep doing this if your card gets pulled out? And they were like, yeah. So they got off for free. We just said, take your cards out. It's me against him. So anyway, I go in the last two and um, I come second. So I make 500 and lose, he loses the bill. So it's <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, I was, I was like, I'm not having this young kid come up here in my joint. I'm like, try and open it here. So I just like went with it. <laughs> oh god um okay the other question and we'll start to wrap up but um playing against guys who were or are the best of the world and the biggest names in poker like your phil ivy's doyle brunson's things like that guys who you would have watched perhaps growing up and then you're playing against them is that was that quite intimidating or a special moment um definitely for the first time like um I can remember every time, like the first time I played against like Negroni, the first time I played, played against Ivy, the first time I played against Phil Helmuth. It's actually funny. I didn't actually play against Helmuth until like a couple of years ago. He was the one guy I never played against, like even though, you know, we're in a lot of the same tournaments. Um, but yeah, like at the end of the day, they're just another poker player. You know, everyone gets two cards. And um, actually, because they played live poker and we, you know, I play mostly online, we I probably play way more hands than them even though they've been playing poker a longer time so that's kind of like the way i try to look at it as, is actually you have, you have more experience yourself than they do like it's so hard to get in a lot of hands playing live poker just because you have to wait every time and i'm playing like 10 games at once online so yeah that's the way i try to look at it like okay i've played more hands than them and uh at the end of the day just they're just another player and you know oftentimes now people will think that about me so um but yeah the first time you play against him it's definitely like wow this is pretty cool so i remember like running a big bluff against phil ivy and just being so nervous and i thought i was giving the game away i, was, I just felt myself breathing really heavy and i just couldn't control it and like against anyone else i would have been fine i would just be like happy with whatever happened like i've made this move and live and die by it but against phil ivy i was just like he's just gonna see into, uh, into my soul and actually somehow i he folded so i don't know maybe he just felt sorry for me or something but uh and luckily our our table broke which means like you got moved to a new table so i didn't get ahead of myself and try and do it again but yeah i got to bluff him once so that was enough for me i'm laughing thinking about because i know you would have again intricate detail of every step of that ivy hand and you could tell him that, <laughs> <laughs> that you've, you've you've done a service to our audience there um one of the biggest misconceptions in poker and when you talk to people at poker they're like, oh i'd be no good at poker because i give tells away people would be able to read what i have based on my face that's not true for the most part but are there players like perhaps phil ivy or phil helmuth that you think really have that sort of extra sensing ability to be able to do that um yeah i think there's like some um what's the word like i think it definitely comes into play i don't think it's a, as big a thing as people like make out when they learn in the game poker they're like oh i can read people like a book like the average person shouldn't really give away too much there's definitely times people do like like i'm saying like a pro generally won't give away much information but like you know you get some random guy um who's just playing his first tournament and then they're gonna they can often tell you exactly kind of what they have like they'll straight away even before they dealt cards they'll tell you like this is their first tournament it's a big deal for them so you know that kind of players probably you know you can always already stereotype this guy as you know if they're making big bets they're gonna have a good hand generally like a lot of people give away a lot of information by their table chat so i i never really listen to headphones use headphones at the table because i want to like engage with people ask them where they're from uh, how many tournaments they've played this world series of poker stuff like that so you can find out if they're a pro or they're an amateur um but when you're actually in a hand generally a pro won't give much away but amateurs will <laughs> they'll like bet really fast on the river on the last card uh sometimes or just they'll give away stuff and the, the important thing is so uh, different things can mean different things for different people so you just have to pay close attention when you're playing and um whenever you get to see their hands say someone calls them you make a mental note of how they played that hand um did they play it fast did they like take their time did they did, did they give any reaction so there's it's, obviously there's books and everything on it and it's different for different people though so 
it is kind of like an expert would get quite a lot of information, I believe. But like someone like me who's played a lot still gets some information, but not like I would trust my more. I would trust the. It's it's weird. I trust my gut, and I also trust like the, like the sort of maths and science behind it all as well. So I have to use a combination of both and it can get like cloudy at times. And when you make the wrong decision, it can be frustrating because you might listen to one over the other. Um, but yeah, all, all the information's there in front of you. So when, when you're playing live, you definitely have more information than when you're playing online. Whereas online, you just have a computer screen and you, you can only really do it based on their, their timing and how quick they acted. But you, often they could be playing 10 games at once. So that stuff is not as, as foolproof as when you're just sitting there face to face with a player and you can you can get some information for sure it all makes sense Shane. um during the course could you could you be playing online poker right now while you're doing this podcast with us do you have that ability to multitask like are you that far down the line now with it you can do that um um i could play like one table and be fine doing this but any more than that then i probably would struggle to have like a proper proper conversation like a, like an act i could have like a you know like a small conversation but not like a whole like podcast but yeah like a lot of the decisions when i'm playing poker like 99 percent of the decisions are pretty like straightforward and then you get some complex decisions that you have to take a lot of thought over so like a lot of the time i'll just be auto making moves on uh other tables and sort of um, I know I'm folding that hand. I know I'm playing that hand. And then it depends how I'm going to play it. So, yeah, 99% of the decisions are straightforward. And then it's just those 1% are really like the crucial ones. Um, they make the difference between like winning and losing, really. So it's not something you can just go into autopilot and kind of do. You still um, need to you can, but them. like back in the day, you could do that a lot more because people were a lot worse. Now, um, especially online, the games are a lot harder. Um, everyone kind of generally most people have um a pretty strong game they have good good game plan and like know what they're doing so you actually have to be paying attention and uh like when i first started playing i would play like 25 games at once and now i won't really play more than 10. so back then you just play as many as you could play without running out of time because like you get they give you each poker site gives you a, a time bank to act on your hand um so you just you would just keep loading up tables until you couldn't handle anymore. But now you actually have to be paying attention and you have to actually <laughs> know what you're doing a bit more. Chris, you just turned 37 uh, during the World Series, which is quite old for a poker player now, um, but you've still got a lot of years left of working. Um, do you think, what do you, what do you, when you think about the future, do you think you'll keep playing poker? Do you think there's, there's other things you'll do with your life? um yeah for now i think i'll keep playing like i'll keep playing um as long as it's fun to me basically so if it starts to lose its appeal and i want to do something else then or I get more interested in something else then uh, i i'll make the switch but for now like i still have a lot of fun with it especially like the world series of poker that's like every year when that comes around i'm really pumped up to try and do my best and uh like uh make final tables and that and yeah so I'm still really like motivated to play online on Sundays. Sundays is like the one day of the week which you can win big money. But like back in the day, I would play all week and like maybe like Monday to Friday is more of a grind. It's like almost like clocking in um, for a job and you know, you're your own boss. So uh, now I don't tend to do that as much. I'll play like one or two days during the week just to keep myself fresh and know what I'm doing. Um, but Sundays are the days I get really excited for online and then. Um, big tournaments in the summer at the World Series is what I'm sort of motivated for as well. So the rest of the year, like I'll, I'll take quite a bit of time off, uh, a lot more than I used to. And then when I do play, I, I'm excited to play and I sort of wake up early and ready to go. Well, yeah, I hope you do keep playing because I look forward to following your, your future journey. Shay, did that all make sense today? Yeah, I actually just want to thank you. I guess we're coming towards the end of it, but I want to thank you for actually making that digestible for someone like me. <laughs> has a has a has a base level or like a, a a rudimentary understanding of what you're doing but as steven said i, I like you've dumbed down some of those things I, I imagine this is a different experience for you um not talking about specifics of hands and when they do xyz you do 
this, this, and this. So streets and rivers and turns, yeah, yeah. And barrels and things on the flop and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> no, to be fair, I've, I've had plenty of times I have to explain to like an Uber driver or something. They're like, oh, <laughs> oh thanks. <laughs> uh, or, or family or stuff like that. But no, I mean, the funny thing is a lot of people think when you're playing poker, they think you're playing against the casino when actually you're playing against other players you know they've seen free card poker in the casino and they obviously know roulette and um games like that so they're like how can you win when you're playing against casino and uh, i try to explain to them you're actually playing against other players and the casino are just making guaranteed money because uh each time say you buy in for a thousand dollars the casino will take a hundred dollars for the rake so they basically get that money that's how they guarantee their money but as long as you're beating the game by more than 10 percent, then you're you know you can make money so so yeah, and you've, like, lost, you've lost me again. And you've lost me again. <laughs> <laughs> but the, these Uber drivers must think they've got another sucker in the back. Oh yeah, good yeah. on you, mate. Yeah, yeah. go on the casino. Yeah, you you get it this time. So they, 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 try they try and tell me about their hands. They try and tell me about their poker hands they played and did they play it well? And I have to. Admit. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's the well, hopefully this hasn't been that painful. Uh, we have loved it. Thanks so much for coming on and, and sharing your story, Chris. Um, it's been awesome. No, oh, thanks for having me. It was good fun. Good to catch up. Good to see a friendly face still. <laughs> <laughs> nice one, man. That was awesome. Oh, fuck. That was cool, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was... Uh, that was fucking really cool. That was so... Like, that is so fascinating, man. I am amazed by, like, that whole world, like, how the sausage is made. <laughs> it is incredibly interesting. Our listeners are going to love that. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's crazy. It's like, obviously now for me, it's like, it feels normal, but always people are like intrigued by it for sure. And really nice to meet you. I mean, you've been an enigma. Like I just, <laughs> know, I just know you as a name. I feel like I've listened to like six hours straight because I did a, a few of your, um, your poker podcasts last night as well. Oh, that was what I forgot to ask. Never mind. That's okay. What is that? You seem so calm. So calm when you talk now. I can't imagine you being like a super aggressive cards player, but um, I guess that's just all. Oh no, I hate I hate losing at anything. If it's any, anything, like I just hate to lose. The uh, the chat was popping off when I told um, Puggy and Goldsbury and Beige you were coming on, just flowing with Mormon stories. I'm trying to pick which ones are suitable <laughs> to use. Yeah, there's um, always always stories floating about from everywhere. yeah it'll be nice to reconnect uh, it'll be nice to get get the gang together again yeah sometime. at some point yeah i don't know when that would be but um i saw i saw neil was out a uh, visionary he was out this year and so i saw him briefly oh is he still playing yeah he's, he was back playing a bit and because uh yeah he came out for a couple of weeks i saw him a, um a couple of times now actually Shit. So, he must be the was... only one from that crew that still him and you are the only ones still going yeah, yeah, he's got a serious girlfriend there and everything. Uh, cool, growing up. Yeah. Um, God, man, I'll, I'll let you go anyway, Morms. Thanks so much, Brad. Um, we will publish that on Monday, so two days' time. Um, but is there anything there that, that you, you want back or, or worried about? No, I think it's all good. I think, yeah. Yeah, pretty sure. Um, I'll just flick, flick you a link when it's live and. Uh, yeah get you uh out to the ears of the kiwi public nice all right sounds good all right yeah all right. And, uh, Cheers, more. Yeah, is it good to meet you man? Yeah, yeah nice to meet you too take it easy all right see you later Bye. is it recorded hopefully eh? what do you do here just go in broadcast, broadcast yeah.